favorite. I can I can give you a, a short list of some of my favorite places. Uh, one is Tuscany in in Italy. Uh, I'm part Italian. Um, another one is is Irish. I I love the Irish heritage, and but I'm three quarters Irish also. So in, anything in Ireland kind of touches me deeply. Uh, and, and it's a beautiful country with with very folksy, talkative, imaginative, storytelling people. And I love storytelling, so th- those those folks always fit in real well with me. Uh, the Dordogne Valley in, in France is the most medieval part of France, and it's it's one of the most beautiful places in the world. It's it's really the dividing line between what used to be English France and uh, French. France when in medieval times when they were fighting each other in the times of Henry V and things like that. And uh, just these beautiful castles up on bluffs protecting the, the river, and a slow meandering river and grapevines and, and just utter, utter beauty everywhere. Uh, that's one of my favorite. The Valley of the Incas in Peru um, is one of my favorites. It's a very spiritual place. And as soon as you start descending into it, on your way to Machu Picchu, for example, you can feel it. It's palpable. There's just, there's just, it's like your skin begins to get this electric crawl to it that immediately wakes you up. Um, wow. It reminds me of James Redfield's uh, Celestine Prophecy. Which I've heard about, and I've, I've not read, but yes, yes, I've, I've uh, referenced parts of that on occasion. Um the Lakes District in, in England is, is pretty spectacular. Uh, then there's, uh, um, i trying to think on the, on the most recent trip, all the, the spectacular wonders of Egypt. Uh, th- there's a reason that Egypt is special, and I, I really want to put in a plug for the Egyptian people. They are incredibly friendly, e- equally as, as friendly as the Turkish people. It's just that Turks are doing better right now because the Muslim Brotherhood has really screwed things up for the, the Egyptians. And they have a new uh, president now who's a hardliner. He's much more of a hardliner than the American president with regard to holding the line on Muslim extremism. And he, he's essentially, uh, his name is Sisi, he's essentially made it illegal uh, for extremism to, and to threaten the elected order. And so I think tourists are coming back. But at one time they had uh, in... 2011, uh, before his predecessor was elected, they had 11 million visitors a year. And then he became too chummy with the Muslim Brotherhood, and he went down to 1 million. And the people were just hurting everywhere because they were so dependent on the tourist trade. And I, I had men who would come up in the streets and get down on their knees and pull on my, my clothing and cry out, buy something or please, just buy anything. My, my children haven't eaten today. I haven't sold anything all week. And uh, you really feel for them because they, ha- they have these amazing antiquities from the pyramids to uh, Abu Simbel, way, way down the, the south part of the country as, as you get up against the Sudan where they wow. uh, moved up uh, temples about 200 feet uh, uphill um, and a couple hundred yards back in one of the greatest archaeological engineering feats ever done where they disassembled an existing temple that was going to be um, overcome by the rising waters of the Aswan Dam. And they mm-hmm. disassembled that one 60-ton block at a time. They cut up about 1,400 of these blocks and moved it uphill. And, and now it's just it's incredible, absolutely incredible. Is that the Temple of Isis, Larry? Uh no, the Temple of Isis was done just a little bit earlier, and that's actually between the two dams in the Nile, between the, the old uh, Aswan Dam built by the British in 1902 and the uh, modern dam uh, called the High Dam that was built by the Russians in the 1970s. And the Temple of Isis has got to be one of the most beautiful temples I've ever seen anywhere, any country, any time. It's just it's absolutely stunning. And they relocated that in the same way from a, a, a island that was uh, being inundated by the floodwaters of the Nile, and they moved it about 300 yards uphill to another island called Anglica Island. And um, in, anybody who is 
anywhere near Aswan needs to go to the Temple of Isis. It is otherworldly beautiful. Absolutely stunning. So well, I, I have think a, there's, there's so many other favorites I've got, Rich, that it virtually takes prompts. Uh, it, at some point, I, I do want to tell everybody about North Korea just because that's such a novelty. Uh, but I, I await other questions from you. Absolutely. And, and we have a surprise here. A guest six reveals that she is Becky. That's Becky in there as guest six in the chat room. And you're going to relate to this. Uh, she says, County Cork and County Donegal here. I'm sure that's an Irish ref- reference there. My family's from County Cork. Ah. Brogan, Brogan's and Dean Tanner's, Becky, if that means anything to you. I'll bet it will, and I bet she'll be back in the chat room in a minute to, to make another comment. Well, touch on, on North Korea again a little bit, if you'd like. Well, well Mary and North- Rich, I need to excuse myself and let you continue. Thank you so much. Thank you for calling in, Wendy. Bye Wendy, now. Thank you for being here. Of course. Goodbye. Bye. Yeah, if you want to go uh, okay. on for a minute or two with Korea, we still have a few minutes left. All right. Um, North Korea is just a a charade. It, it's They have fancied themselves and they have uh, portrayed themselves to their population as being a modern, envied society that other countries look up to. And, of course, that that's not the case at all. They can't even feed their own people. They supposedly had 10,000 people dying of famine within the last year or two in North Korea. They put most of their resources in, into the military and then into the oh, Kim Il-sung, Kim Jong-il, and Kim Jong-un, the, the three uh, puppet uh, uh, dictators that they've had ever since uh, World War II. And everything is dedicated to them. And uh, it, it's huge statues, 60, 70 feet tall. There's like 3,500 of these statues, not all that big, but wall templates, posters, uh, statues, um, bronze plaques everywhere, in every public place, every streetcar has got some homage to them or some book that they supposedly wrote, which is really ghost-written. The current dictator, Kim Jong-un, he he couldn't write his, his own name on a uh, piece of paper if, if forced to. So there's no possibility of him writing a, a book at all. Uh, but they give him credit for all the, these uh, pieces of, of wisdom. Literally a love, cult, of, cult of personality. Cult, has cult been of personality. Yeah, yeah you, you pegged it exactly, uh, better, better than my words. But ongoing cult of personality that is, uh, passes from father to son. And... Uh, they carry uh, a number of mistresses, and so if, if their wife doesn't have uh, a son, then they'll pick up the lineage through one of the mistresses. Um, but they they love to compete with the United States. And so, for example, the Washington Monument for the longest time was the world's largest stone monument. And um, North Koreans wanted to build one that was taller so they could say, we've got even bigger than the Washington Monument, the world's largest stone monument. And so they built one, I think it was something like three meters taller. Well, they forgot, and they only investigated national monuments. They forgot that the state of Texas, the Republic of Texas, has a monument, uh, the San Jacinto Monument, which is about three meters taller still than theirs. So it's one of those <laughs> laughing points where they didn't quite look far enough, and they just wanted to beat down the, the, the uh, Yankee imperial of badasses, and they <laughs> they. They didn't worry about what the state of Texas or anybody else had done. And so theirs is not quite the biggest. They did the same thing for a while with the world's largest flagpole. Um, The South Koreans put up a flagpole in the demilitarized zone, which I got to approach from both directions, from the south side and then again from the north side. And it it was an incredible tour. But you see this one upsmanship going on where the North Koreans always want to have bigger and better. And then... uh, I think there's the fourth tallest now. Uh, a couple of Mid- Middle East countries put up flagpoles that are even taller. Um, the biggest boondoggle they had was the Ryongyang Hotel in Pyongyang, the capital. And this hotel is 105 stories and had like eight rotating restaurants at, at the top, kind of like the Seattle Space Needle. And 
they uh, bragged about it being the world's largest hotel. The problem that they forget to convey or the added information that they forget to tell you about is it's been under construction for 27 years. It's never been completed. And the only thing that you see that makes it look impressive is the outside. When you get in the inside, it's still a bunch of electrical stubs and plumbing stubs, raw concrete, and there's not a single room that's been completed and nobody's ever stayed there. So that that's very emblematic of North Korea. It's all it's all show. Appearance. A lot of it's it all, yeah, show, all appearance, yeah. All all blue smoke and mirrors. We're we're bigger, we're badder, we're better. Um and, and for example, you go to the Imperial War Museum and they make the the Korean War the fault of the Americans. They don't blame the South Koreans, it's all the fault of the Americans. And they blame America for invading North Korea when I think the whole world knows that North Korea invaded South Korea. And the way that they support this is they take film from six months later when America and the South Koreans did invade North Korea, and they just change the timing around on it and say, say, here they are, they're attacking us by surprise, those those Yankee imperialist mongrel dogs and uh, the other creative language that they, they use all the time. By the way, one of the most interesting parts of the tour that you're allowed to go on there uh, where they monitor you very closely was the USS Pueblo, which was captured in 1968, a U.S. intelligence ship. Uh-huh. It was captured and was was a big deal at the time because the U.S. claimed it was in international waters and the North Koreans say that it wasn't. But they humiliated the crew, kept the ship, and then they, they use it now as a uh, training ground or for the dedication for any anybody new in the military and the army, they make them go aboard the, the USS Pueblo. And the message is, this is what we do to bullies. We beat them down. Nobody can take us. We are the strongest country on earth. And they just keep spreading that story. And you know, wow. people who are withheld information and are not fed properly and really have no outside source of information, after a while it becomes believable. Sure, they're brainwashed into it. Yeah, yeah. And you particularly see it on, on the mausoleum to the two Kims, to Kim Jong-il and, and uh, Kim Il-sung. And it, it's hero worship in the extremists. I mean, they've got everything. They've got their personal golf carts, their their Mercedes limousines, their uh, boats. Um, and, of course, they're stuffed like uh, Lenin was in the uh, – stuffed and, and waxed up. So you, you walk by them, and they, they make you walk by, and they even make Westerners bow – and that's that's a real struggle for some of us. You 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 quit your teeth and you do it very imperceptibly, um, but eventually you do it because there's armed guards nearby and they're they're very adamant about everybody bows. So you you kind of just barely bend over a little bit and you grit your teeth and you close your eyes and remain very very stiff and and uninvolved. But it's, it's something that they kind of require if you want to see it. And, it, and it's such an amazing mausoleum. Um, it, it makes the mausoleum in, in uh, Tiananmen Square in Beijing to Mao Zedong, mm-hmm. and the one to Lenin and uh, to uh, uh, Stalin and some of the other famous world leaders. It, it makes them look paltry. It, it's really an amazing building. So I'm sure you've done extensive photography in all of this, much of which appears in your books as well. The photography, Rich, does appear in the books, but it's black and white, so it's not quite as good as my blog. And the blog okay. has the color photography, which is much more compelling, and that's called uh, freestyleworldtraveler.blogspot.com. It's easy to find. It's a blogging platform for Google, Blogspot. So just remember, freestyleworldtraveler.blogspot.com and have access to uh, hundreds, hundreds of, of you know, these classic type photos of these places I'm describing from all over the world. Becky has said something else in the chat room. Yes, she, this is again on the Irish note. Gilpatrick and Glacken. Of course, Glacken is uh, her heritage. Yes, yes. It didn't didn't quite ring a bell. Patrick and what was the other name? Gilpatrick and Glacken. G L A C K E N. Okay. Yeah, not not familiar with that one, but uh we we do share County Cork in common. Fantastic. 
she made a few remarks too about North Korea here that was uh, paralleling what we were discussing earlier. They think the leader is a pop star. Uh, they have stores that are fronts. The food is not real, and no one can go inside. Did you observe some of that? Yes, yes. Um, they give the illusion that there's food, uh, but they may leave the packing cans there in the front for people to see, but when you get inside, it's not there. Uh, remember, there's language difficulties, and they only the interpreters and the the uh, handlers that we had would tell us what the regime wanted us to tell. They had very good jobs, and they had access to Western food and got to hang out with Westerners so they could find out what was going on in the world, and they weren't going to do anything that would imperil that. So they were sure, while they were friendly with us in person, very, very friendly, they still went through the speech about the imperialist uh, American warmongers and so forth, I mean, right right to our face. And you can tell that they kind of are going through the motions, that they mm-hmm. don't particularly believe it anymore from what they've heard from Europeans and from the others, but they, they've got to do it because it's part of the script that they've been handed. And then, uh, for example, there's a show village, a virtual Potemkin village, as you're looking down on the DMZ, which is about four kilometers wide, two on each side. From the South Korean side, and you're looking down on this show village that the North Koreans have, and they have guys out front that are sweeping the the uh, sidewalks, and they have a rotation of the lights to make it look like the lights go on at night. But when you use high-powered telescopes and you look inside, nobody's ever there. There's no cabinets. There's no rugs, bare concrete floors. It's just for show. And and that that, in essence, is North Korea. It's just for show. They don't have a, wow. a standard of living that approaches even most African standard of living. Wow, that sums it up in a nutshell, doesn't it? It does, it does. But it's fascinating, nevertheless. I, I would encourage anybody who had the opportunity, go to North Korea. It's easier than ever. They want the Yankee dollars. And unless you try to pass out Bibles or something that they clearly make known ahead of time is against the rules, you're just not going to get any trouble. It, unless you start denoun- denouncing the regime, uh, or you know, say Kim Jong Un is a is a fool uh, or a traitor or something like that, you're 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 going to enjoy yourself. You're not going to have any trouble there. No no trouble at all. Thank you, Lauren. In wrapping up, uh, I'd like to uh, give you an opportunity to go ahead and announce the uh, title of your book again and where it can be found, and and you can also. Uh, reference the other to the earlier books as well. Well, it's it's rich. It's it's all a series. It's called True North. It's about the the 96 countries that I've I've been to around the world. And I don't describe hotels and I don't describe restaurants you should go into. This is travel adventure. This is about culture and history and adventures like running into the guy who wanted to kill me in Jordan, and you know really wonderful people that I call road angels and that sort of thing. So it's not your your Rick Steves type of of uh travel book. It's it's travel adventure. This is a, a story. Real about life guts exciting things material. that happen. Sorry? Real life gutsy material and not just a little travel log. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So it's True North is the series and there's about fifty books in Amazon with True North in them, at least in part. So you want to tie it in the search feature to Lawrence Sonato, L-A-W-R-E-N-C-E, Sonato, C-E-N-O-T-T-O. Think of like Moonlight Sonata, Sonato. Mm -hmm. And it's the ultimate around-the-world journey uh, is the the title of of this book. And I I guarantee your listeners, you will not be disappointed. This is an absolutely amazing narrative of what happened for me and what I discovered in 36 countries. Lawrence, again, I want to thank you for being my guest tonight, and I'd like to invite you back in the future to be a return guest as well. Rich, I can't wait to come back. Invite me as soon as you can. This has been a real pleasure. You, you've asked yeah. some great questions, by the way. Thank you, Larry, and have a great evening. And all our okay. listeners out there, remember you can download and listen to and archive this show. and share.